All right, everybody. Celtics and Thunder, a potential finals preview going down to TD Garden on Wednesday night. Here to get you set up. It's Green with Envy. You know the deal. Let's lock in. What up, what up, what up? Welcome into another edition of Green with Envy. We've got ourselves a preview podcast here. Boston Celtics, Oklahoma City Thunder in Boston on Wednesday night. This is your boy, Will Weir, checking in. Joining me today to help give you the preview that you need. It is the lead writer for Celtics blog, the leader of the Taylor gang, the one and only Adam Taylor. Adam, what's popping? Yo, what's popping, man? What's popping? As you can see, my screen's a little bit flaky. We're having some lighting issues. Need to get that resolved. I blame the dog. Hey, Other than that, this is this is this is the downside of content creation, folks. Me and Adam spend and Greg, we spend 10 to 15 minutes every podcast. How does my camera look? How's the angle? In all reality, we don't give a fuck. We want to talk basketball, but this is the downside of content creation that you don't see is the shaping, the framing, and all the stuff that you don't care about or you don't care about, but the algorithms care about. So unfortunately, we're forced to care about it. But Adam, enough of that talk. I want to get into this preview because I think this is one of the most fun matchups out there. And especially when you look back on the Celtics season. The game that they played on January 2nd was a pretty influential game, just from a standpoint of it was definitely a game where OKC announced, like, this is not a fluke, right? Like, this team is for real, still vying for the one seed. They're playing in Tuesday. Night. We're recording this Tuesday afternoon. Tuesday night, they'll be in Philadelphia prior to this game on Wednesday. Celtics magic number to clinch the number one overall seed will be one or two by that tip-off. So this game could seal the deal, number one seed all the way through to the finals but when you look at this matchup Celtics Thunder what's the first thing that you're looking at when you when you think of this matchup what's the first thing you go to where the hell are Boston going to be able to score from because that's always the first thing that I go to is like where is Oklahoma's defense giving up buckets because every team has a compromise that they make with themselves right some teams will let you shoot from free because they want to be able to protect the rim and close down the mid-range some teams want to funnel you off the line so they can so you shoot more around the rim or around the mid-range. So that's kind of where I'm at right now is just like coming into this game. I know everybody wants to hear me talk about how you're gonna shut down shy, how you're gonna mm -hmm. deal with Chet. And like we can get to that, but for me at the moment, my number one concern is always where are your shots going to come from? And um, right now, it looks like the and I'll share these numbers because I do this on the Celtics Chronicles, whenever there's a big game, I like to kind of break down the numbers and look where the offense is going to come from. So let me just zoom in here a little bit. So well, I'm kind of hijacking this question. No, you're good. So if you look here, this is defense. So any number that's any one that's orange or dark orange is where they're allowing a lot of shots from. Hold on, sorry. Yeah, where they're not allowing a lot of shots from. Anything that's mm -hmm. blue is where they're allowing a lot of shots from. So they're allowing a lot of shots on the perimeter. They're trying to restrict people in, around the rim, and they're clamping in the mid-range a little bit. Right. Most likely, they're, they're trying to stop teams. They're trying to allow teams to shoot the corner free. They're defending the outside of the three-point line quite well, but they're giving up the corner because they're also trying to close in that mid-range area a little bit. But they're doing a really good job. They're first in the league for defending the rim. So that rim pressure that Boston like to generate, they like to attack early, get downhill, and then open up their drive and kick game, which is called like the spray game. Mm -hmm. That's going to be tough because you're going up against the best de uh, rim defense in the NBA right now. They're also one of the best teams at defending the corner free. Now, when you're driving towards the rim and you're looking to kick out, where's the number one option you're kicking to? The corner. So yeah. they're, got, they're defending at an elite level, two areas where Boston really try and generate their offense from early and often. And that's going to be an interesting battle to me. This is where I think the battle is going to be from the Celtic side is like, hey, we like to pressure the rim. We like to drive and kick out to the corners. We've got Drew Holiday, who's one of the best corner free shooters in the NBA right now. And we've got Jalen Brown, who's one of the best slashers, rim finishers, one of the most explosive play finishers in the NBA. They're going to come up against a team that are designed to stop both of those things from happening. 
So where do we counter? Now, if we go back and look at the mid-range game, the the Thunder are doing a really good job at limiting teams shooting in the mid-range. They're, they're eighth in the NBA for mid-range frequency, which means there's only seven teams doing a better job of limiting mid-range shots than the Thunder right now. So that's going to force Boston into being the version of Boston that we don't want them to be, which is a, a predominantly three-point heavy team with yeah. very little penetration and very little post-action. So that's that's where the chess battle is going to start for me. And that's going to be kind of the number one thing I'm looking at over the first 10 to 25 possessions is how are Boston getting into their offense? Are they settling? Are they trying to work into find gaps? And how does that chess battle start from that point? Yeah, I mean, you think about Oklahoma City, and I like that you started here instead of the obvious, because you're right. The, the first place I probably would have gone to is that is that Shea question. But I do think that when you look at this Thunder team, and they have elite perimeter defense. Like, when you look at SGA, you look at Dort, who's just, you know, a brick shit house. Like, he's one of the thickest dudes in the NBA and can move his feet laterally. Then you look at Jalen Williams, who that's a guy I want to talk about, J-Dub, whatever the – the first J Dub, I forget what the different. How do you separate the two J Dubs again? But it's the tough. starter, the starter J Dub. I want to talk about him. He's an excellent defender. And then you got Chet at the rim. So you have excellent perimeter defense. And I hasn't even mentioned Kason Wallace off the bench. Their rookie who is is phenomenal on the perimeter as well. So they have a lot of really good perimeter defenders. And I mean, to a degree, that kind of sounds like the Celtics defense, right? Like you have a bunch of good perimeter defenders. You then have, whether it's, you know, KP at the rim, like it, there's a lot of similarities between these teams. One of the differences is going to be how can the Celtics, I think for me, how can the Celtics get mismatches to take advantage of, of their height? Right. Because that's one of the areas where the, the Thunder are going to struggle is that they're not a great rebounding team and they're just smaller from a, they're a little long, but they're not tall. And so how can you take advantage with getting KP to a mismatch somewhere either on the nail or the free throw line extended or in the post so that you can take advantage of them having to send a double team? And like you said, not falling into the trap of shooting you know the out too many threes that they're trying to get you to shoot right not playing into their game plan which you know kind of the the gift and the curse of the celtics is that sometimes they might play into your game plan and sometimes it might work out for the celtics because they're that good at shooting they'll just cook you at what you want them to not cook you like you're That's forcing them that way. right yeah, of course <laughs> i think that when you look at the opportunity for that to happen that's great but this close to the postseason against a team that you could potentially I'm not I'm not there yet with Oklahoma, but you could potentially see them in the NBA finals. Mm -hmm. For me, this is all about that chess game. It's all about knowing how they want you to play, knowing how they're looking to defend you, and then finding ways to do to them what they're trying to stop you from doing. Because right. that's to me is always the battle, right? You don't want us to attack the room, you don't want us to shoot corner threes. Okay, cool. So how can we do that? Because once we break you there and force you to adjust, now we're in control of the entire game. We control the tempo. We've made you adjust everything. And now you're in that battle to try and get back on a level footing before you can even take that step and be a step ahead again. Uh, and that battle to me, if you can win that early, you kind of take control of the game and you can control how the runs go from there, how you respond mm -hmm. to them, because they can't default back to their default defense they right. can't default back to their default defense because you've just you've destroyed that you've proven that that right. doesn't you, work. This is the this is the chess move in a in a series, right? Now they yeah. have to adjust. What's the adjustment that you have? And that's what you know we'll have to see. But let's flip this for a second. Let's look at this from Oklahoma City on offense and a Celtics defensive perspective. You know, last time they played, one of the main one of the main strategies the Celtics had was, you know, not putting or putting Porzingis on their non-shooter in their starting offensive lineup, which was Josh Giddy. And Josh Giddy hit four threes. And Josh Giddy can do that. You know, over his last, see, I think I had it pulled up here earlier. Over his last like 15 games or so, you know, he's shooting 41% from three. Not a high volume, 3.9, uh, but 41% on, you know, roughly four shots a game. Like he can burn you on that. So, you know, when you look at this game, Adam, from the Celtics defensive point of view, and we can talk about, you know, guarding Shea and the Celtics threw a lot of bodies at Shea last game. And really, you know, until Tatum in the fourth, didn't really feel like they found much success uh, with guarding Shea. How do you think the Celtics attack defensively the Oklahoma City offense? 
Okay, so let's look at what the the offense does first of all. And if you like these type of breakdowns, sign up to the Celtics Chronicle, CelticsChronicle.com, because I do these for every big game and I go a little bit more in depth. I don't know why someone's at my door. Bear with me, and we're going to have to pause the recording. So let's look at how this goes from the offensive side of things, right? So we'll start with frequency. They are a very midway, mid-range frequent team, and I like this because they're playing out of the nail a lot. They're playing off the elbows in that mid-post, and then creating offense out of there, they'll either shoot or they'll create some gravity, right? From the perimeter, what you'll see is they're not exactly a high-volume team, same at the mm-hmm. rim. But if you look, this is pretty even. It's 33.1% at the rim, 34.8% from perimeter, 32.1% from mid-range. So what that tells me is they don't over-focus anywhere. It's very balanced across the board. And I think this is a good thing from Mark Dagnall because he has actions on all three levels and they consistently iterate between those three levels in terms of their offense and where they like to generate their shots. So what that leads to then is a pretty efficient, if we look at how this team looks offensively, uh, 67.5% finishing around the rim. That's about middle of the pack in the league. 47.3% from mid-range, top three in the NBA for mid-range conversion. First in the league for their three-point shooting, especially from non-corner. Top 10 in terms of shooting from the corner. So they're playing a very even killed um, game in terms of where their shots come from, and they're crushing it everywhere apart from mm-hmm. the rim. You know what I mean? So how do you defend that? Well, you try and funnel them to the rim. Right. That's the pretty that's pretty much what you're gonna need to do. You're gonna want to run them off the three-point line. You're gonna want to send gap help when you when they attack the close out. So you're denying that mid-range pull-up. So it's gonna be need to get some gap help, some nail help, and you want to funnel them into your Chris Stapps, Paul Zingas, or Al Horford, or Jason Tatum, who's rotating over from the weak side as a help defender. And you're going to want to really force them to shoot around the rim. More more shots you can get them to take there because it's the one area they don't, like, air quotes, excel, Mm -hmm. based on what we're seeing right now. That, to me, is going to be where that chess game is on the other side. Boston are going to want to funnel them off the three-point line, send help in the mid-range, and make them a a two-point layup and dunk shoot, dunk team. It's going to be the main... So who do you think? Because I think the the head of the snake for this team is obviously SGA, right? And and let me preface this for those listening. You know, we're recording this Tuesday afternoon. We don't know what the injury report will be, who will be in and out officially yet. Uh, OKC is in Philly Tuesday night. As of the time of this recording, both SGA and J-Dub, the starter, starter Jalen Williams, uh, are questionable to play in that game. So we'll have to see what that injury report looks like. But let's assume Shea, who just came back on uh, on Sunday, hit a game winner in New York in Madison Square Garden. Let's assume that he's playing in this game, Adam. Who do you think draws that assignment? Because in the first matchup, Drew got the bulk of the assignment and SGA kind of cooked him. Jalen Brown had some moments where it was, you know, a little, little bit up and down, but SGA had his way. Tatum had probably the most success out of those three that drew that were the main uh, defenders against Shea in that game in early January. When you look at the way that this defense is playing, and specifically, I think Jalen Brown's the most interesting candidate to me just because of his vocal vocalness about wanting to take on those top assignments each night, whether it's Dame Lillard or if it's Giannis, or if it's Zion, you know, not not necessarily saying, hey, I don't care if it's a big guy, I want him. Or if it's a little guy, Jalen just wants all the smoke right now. And Jalen's very happy to sit there and tell you that he wants all the smoke and he wants to be an all-NBA defender. And he's been backing it up to his credit. He's been 100% backing it up. How do you see Missoula drawing up those assignments for, for SGA in this game? Yeah, so I'm going to start this by saying what I always say. When it comes to a star-level talent, like an All-NBA first-team guy, All-NBA second-team guy. Which is SGA. Yep. My outlook has always been you contain them as best as you can, but you shut down everybody else around them. So the the game plan to me is how do we keep Giddy quiet? How do we keep Chet quiet? How do we keep Williams quiet? How do we keep Wallace quiet? And then we live with whatever SGA does. Right, you live with it because it's the same as if Tatum's on a heater. You, there's no point stopping it. You live with it and you minimize 
the impact elsewhere. How do you make their life as difficult as possible yeah. and limit whatever opportunities? And that's just them? for someone like SGA that's really quick. He's put on some muscle. A lot of that's just going to be sending gap help early and stunting on him, making that dribble difficult to keep a live dribble, making him pick up the ball a bit earlier, showing bodies, getting physical. I would expect Jalen Brown to pick up the beginning uh, start of this assignment. And then you kind of go from there, right? Like having a great game against Zion does not mean you're going to have a great game against SGA because we're talking right. two completely different players with completely different skill sets. I think Brown has the athleticism and the explosiveness where he should be able to stay in front or at least down the hip of SGA. One thing we're going to want to see from Jalen, and I think he's been quite good at this this year, but if he genuinely wants to take on these lead guard defense assignments, he needs to take a leap on screen navigation. I think he's been mm -hmm. solid, but he needs to be exceptional because yeah. once the postseason starts and there's two, three, four screens being thrown at you and you're having to weave in and out of them, it's tough. I think Jalen starts. Yeah, I think that's struggles. probably why Holiday got the main assignment to because begin with. Because his screen right? navigation he's is amazing so good. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that this is where I'm going to go. Like, I do think it's going to be a Jalen, Drew, and JT kind of tandem where mm -hmm. we're going to switch. We're going to anticipate your actions. We're going to anticipate where your screens are coming from. We're mm -hmm. always going to have a Tatum or a Holiday. And this is where D. White being on the opposite side of the floor is so clutch because it's like, shit, even if you go the opposite way and you get switched on to D. White, right. it's, not, it's tough. We're making it tough on you. So that's going to be, for me, I think you start with Jalen Brown and then you iterate through the guys. And if mm -hmm. one starts working, maybe you stick man-to-man -man and you go from there. But for me, you just contain him and you try and shut down everybody else. And that's difficult against Oklahoma because of Giddy's playmaking. Yeah, exactly. And they have another person that they can just give the ball to and can create. And so that's where it becomes, do you leave Giddy? Or you know how, how do you handle that scenario? But I'm curious, Adam, just... How much of the Thunder have, have you watched this year? Have you had a chance? To Not as much as what I'd game? like. Nowhere right. near as much as what, what I'd like. What has stood out to you when when you've when you've watched this team? I'm curious. Uh, play calling versatility. The, the, like I really like some of the stuff they've run. Mm -hmm. I think it's quite yeah. fluid. I think it's quite modern. Very modern offense. Very modern defense. SGA's ability to just penetrate off the dribble or penetrate as an off ball cutter is insane. I think Chet has really opened things up. Chet has had. A very similar impact on Oklahoma as what KP has had on Boston, just yeah. in terms of he's just opened the floor up. He, he's made their space in completely different level. And he does kind of give them that same similar X factor. I think as much as Giddy's been negatively, well, as much as he, I, I'm trying to say this as politically correct as possible for everything that he's gone through off the court with everything that yeah. he's done and, you know, and obviously that's some bullshit what he did if he did it like there's a lot of feelings there you yeah know, there's, a, there's a lot of ambiguity there. yeah and i'm not there to, i'm not here to speak on that but for everything that he's gone through off the court i think he's taken a bit of a jump mm -hmm. in terms of development like he's a really really good player had a triple to double against was it against new york on saturday I, yeah i heard something crazy like i think he's played there three times and had three triple doubles or something yeah, like he's something just, to that effect like when Giddy was coming out of the draft, he was my kind of draft darling. Like I'm a big fan of what Giddy does on the floor. And I think that he's kind of such a difficult guy to guard because of the way he plays and how he unlocks everything else. So that's kind of stood out to me as well. So, and then obviously Williams is just yeah really fun to watch. So I want to talk about Jay Williams just for a second, because he, he's the guy for me that I, I don't think until recently I've started to really appreciate just how good yeah. this guy is. And, you know, you referenced that Knicks game. Uh, I rewatched the end of that game the other night and Shea hit the, the big shot, but Shea had 19 points in that game. That was kind of a down game for Shea. It was obviously his first game back after missing a few uh, with an injury, but Jalen Williams was the one carrying them in that fourth quarter. And when you look at this team, number one, how young they are and how composed they are is extremely impressive. This yeah. team does not seem to be rattled. And case in point, they're the number one offensive rated team in the clutch in the entire NBA. And when you dig into that and you look at their big three of SGA, Jalen Williams, and Chet Holgren, let me just read you their clutch time stats this year. SGA, 57% from the field, 35% from three, 88% from the line. Jalen Williams, 69.2% from the field, 
58.3% from three, 82% from the line. Chet Holmgren, 54% from the field, 46.7% from three, 75% from the line. And that's the they're the ones that are touching the ball late in the game that are making all the decisions. Like from three really young guys in this league, like SGA is what, in his fourth or fifth year? He's the veteran in this group. Like those are insane numbers. Once again, Jalen Williams is shooting 70% on 40 shots. He's he's had 30, excuse me, 39 shots. Jalen Brown's got 40 shots in the clutch. So it's not like Jalen Williams is a small sample size. Like these guys all have very high sample size statistics to look from. And so in the clutch to see the way that these young guys perform, like that is something that that kind of blows my mind with this team. It makes me despite some of my reluctancy on the things that they lack in terms of veteran savvy. And we talked about them being a relatively small team. The fact that they're this, this composed this young and execute at this much of a high level in high leverage situations. Like it makes me hesitant to write this team off. And Jalen Williams, like I said, I think that's going to be the guy that I'm looking at to see, like you said, SGA, we got to contain him. We got to make his life difficult and you need to shut down the guys around him. For me, I'm starting to look at, all right, who's taking the Jalen Williams assignment and what yeah. does that look like in this game? I think that's really going to be the number one thing that I'm looking for is, is how the Celtics address Jalen Williams on both sides of the ball. Yeah. And that's going to be another one of those challenges in terms of who's one of your better off ball defenders, right? Because he's going to be off ball. They're going to try and run actions to get him onto the ball and force some favorable switches from Boston. So who can you have as your two off ball defenders where you've got one guy that can be on him to begin with. And then one guy to scram out the mismatch once this, which happens if Boston go to a scram style defense. So Derek white could be the guy, but he's a bit small. I feel mm -hmm. like Tatum's best used as a helper in these situations, but he can play off-ball defense. He's really good at playing the passing lane, can top lock well, has good size, good strength. There's an option. Obviously, you could always go with like a Tillman type early sub in just to have that versatility on the perimeter mm -hmm. that can switch and bang on drives and stuff as well. I think that the Celtics have got a really good rotation of defensive pieces that all excel differently but williams is going to be one of those guys that really tests that starting five if we're talking about the starting williams obviously yeah. um because i just think that most of the on ball defense is going to be thrown at shy like at sga but the problem is those on ball defenders are also boston's best off ball defenders right. so it's going to be a really tough kind of line to walk unless you start incorporating Tatum more into this off ball kind of chase the role which isn't yeah. really where he excels uh you mentioned Tillman do you think this is more of a Tillman game than a Luke game maybe I think that Luke I feel like you can make you a case size. for it either way it's a little yeah, interesting right I, I like I've really liked what Luke's been giving lately I think Tillman hasn't really impressed hasn't found me the way footing, I was no same. not the way I, I've was, been, I was thinking about that the other night too it like, feels like it's there's there's moments you're like that's what I was looking for, but then there's other moments where it just hasn't it's not quite clicked, just clicked yet. yet. And the fact that he's willing to take those threes, but he's just not hitting them, is is certainly a detriment on the offensive side. Yeah. Uh, and the, and the defense has been definitely you can see the thought process of of where he should be fitting in, but it hasn't quite matched up with the the theory the the actuality has not matched up quite as seamless as I would have thought uh, with the with the theoretical. Yeah, in his def in his defense, I think his minutes have been quite inconsistent. I think it's been hard for him to find a rhythm. Boston's mm -hmm. defense is quite fast paced in the way they execute, the way they switch on. So look, everything's done quite rapidly. So I think Tillman's just struggling the a keep pace, like in terms of thought process, like you know, um, what do I call it now? Processing speed, defensive processing mm -hmm. speed. I think he's struggling there a bit. Sorry, processing speed. Um, that's an issue. I think offensively, he, um, against who did they play? I'll just write takeaways on it earlier. Against the Hornets, he had some mm -hmm. nice duckings into the post. I think he made himself available, sealed off his man well. That was probably some of the best off ball offensive positioning we've seen from him since he's been in Boston. And he did it against Grant Williams that was having a night on both sides yep. of the floor. But in general, I don't, I'm a lot more comfortable with Luke right now. I think Luke does a lot of things very well. And I think that his size, as you alluded to at the start of the episode, is a um, 
an advantage that you can right. really it's work a difference through. maker yeah. in this it, it just depends you know if he's going to get burnt offense or on the defensive side or not because of that but I, I think this leads into at least the last thing that i'm looking for in this game is i think my prediction for this, this is gonna be one of the last games we see the celtics treat it like a a, a playoff tune-up i think by the time we get to next week we play milwaukee we play the knicks I'm kind of hoping maybe we see either three guys in, three guys out, or maybe we see the starters for a half, and then we're, we're it, it's all about rest. This one, like I said, we're a game or two away from literally having nothing else that we can do in the regular season to achieve the goals that you need to. The one seed in the East is locked up. The one seed overall in the NBA should be locked up in the next couple of days. And so after that, it's just getting to that finish line. And so for me in this game, the last thing I really kind of want to see, and I know Missoula – uh, has been very open about this is this is the benefit of us being this one seed so early we can experiment and play around and so I don't want to read too much into it but I think back to that last matchup against OKC and this is something that also stood out in the series of Denver games is winning the non-Jokic and in this case the non-SGA minutes and I remember distinctly looking back at and I went back and double checked it the game against the Thunder in January it was 98 to 86 entering the fourth. Thunder were up by 12. This was one of the few games where the Celtics were trailing by a good portion and throughout this game consistently, right? And the Celtics made a really strong comeback to even have a chance, but had to be perfect. And Porzingis had that big toe on the line and ultimately weren't able to pull it off. But they're down 12 going into the fourth. SGA and Chet in this scenario both sat until 604. So basically, you get an entire half a quarter without two of their three best players. And the score at, by the time they checked back in was 110 to 95. Celtics lost 12 to 9 in that stretch. You absolutely cannot have that happen, especially when you're trying to make a comeback. But as you're trying to take advantage of those moments, and part of that was the lineup that Missoula started that fourth quarter with had Al, Luke, Jalen Brown, Holiday, and Pritchard. And this reminded me of those non Jokic moments in the most recent game, where in that fourth quarter, no Jokic, but you still had the Tillman and Horford lineup. And that feels like a failure of, of Joe to kind of adjust in the moment to knowing that you got to get some some points on the board. And that double big lineup was great when you had, you know, Jokic out there and you're trying to not get caught on too many severe mismatches. He's a mismatch for everybody, but too many severe mismatches. And so I'm going to be kind of curious to see how Joe, especially if the game is tight late, handle some of those rotation minutes to try to take advantage of star plays being off the court. Because I do think in these high leverage moments, those have been a couple, a couple missed opportunities that I think we, we could have had more. I'm trying to think of the, the right way to phrase this uh, lineups with, with, with a higher ceiling than what we had out there for those moments that could have helped the Celtics catch some ground or put some ground, depending on the situation um, in those moments. Yeah, sometimes I feel like there's an overcommitment to size with these double big lineups. I feel like defensively, when it makes sense, you go to them, but you lose a significant amount of tempo when you run mm -hmm. those double big, especially when you're like a Luke and Al. Like the tempo of the actual like transition play, the way the ball pops around, you lose that. You've got spacing, but it's not spacing with gravity the same way as if you went a little bit smaller and had Hauser and Pritchard on the floor. You want when it's these non-star minutes, you want to space the floor, play with pace, and just drive and kick, drive and kick, pressure, pressure, pressure. And I think that in these non-SJ minutes, and we've seen Missoula go to this a little bit recently, but just not against high-level teams, which we're hoping we'll see tomorrow. We are seeing more, hey, there's a Pritchard and Hauser two-man game that looks pretty good right now. There's a Hauser and Luke Cornet two-man game, a Pritchard and Cornet two-man game. There's two-man games off that stay-ready group that are all blending together right now that we can play at a really good pace. We can hit pitcher heads. We can play out of the pinch post where it's an empty side um, with someone on the block. We can attack empty side actions with drag screens. We can play at a pace because we've got not only do we have the spacing, which would be there with a double big because Cornette does his playmaking thing and his screening thing, Al can hit the three, but we've got gravity with this spacing now because we've got House of Running sprinting to fill one corner. We've got Jalen Brown on the floor that's a threat from everywhere. You've got Pritchard that can sprint and fill, fill the slot. You've got whoever's going to fill the opposite corner can probably nail the three. 
and that gravity really stretches the defense out and then you play with pace and you run these guys off the floor and then when the stars come back in you go back to being big you become more physical you take that tempo down a notch but you keep that spacing to really space guys out and attack yeah. offensively i think that's what we've seen recently with that second unit when missoula has gone to it and as you said if you're trying to win minutes when stars sit that would be my de facto kind of blueprint that we can then kind of go flow chart off of right does this work no right we do this does, and then we can flow right. chart from there but my de facto would be start getting more shooters and more pace on the floor we don't need to be extra big at the um with while losing tempo right when trying to attack while stars aren't on the floor it just doesn't make sense to me you want that tempo yeah i agree man so i think we'll be interesting this will be like i said i think this is the last playoff tune-up that i'm expecting to see we'll see celtics don't really celtics like to play every game to win so we'll have to see how that plays out but like i said there's literally nothing to play for after this night so i'm hoping that this is the last real playoff tune-up that these celtics will be given before it just becomes kind of who's in who's out we're resting and we're getting set for that first round of the playoffs uh anything else that you want to cover on this preview here Adam? that's me good brah i'm good i think we're good here man i think this should be a great game i'm excited for it uh as always adam it is a pleasure checking in with you here for those of you listening remember day after this game thursday we're going to be back three man weave we got ourselves a live stream 5 p.m eastern 4 p.m central Come lock in with you guys. We'll have a recap of the game. So likely no game recap that night. TBD. We might still do one depending on how the game goes. If not, Greg and I might just save our thoughts for when the three-man weave get together the next day. So make sure you come rock with us. Bring some questions for the stretch run here as we count down these the final days, man. And also, it's Mike Gorman's final days too here. We got the last couple of games here. Drew Carter done for the season. Celtics have one road game left. That's going to be on national TV in Milwaukee. So we said our farewells to Drew Carter on the broadcast. Hopefully we might have him back on this podcast before the postseason starts. So we'll work on getting his thoughts on this team. But yeah, it's the, it's the end of the road here, Adam. So we'll be checking in with you guys. Come lock in live stream Thursday, 5 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Central. We'll see you guys later. Enjoy some Black Sheep Optimus on the way out. Till I hit the floor Every time I hit this high It's you I find It don't take much no more Until I'm at your door You cut me to my floor, baby what can I say? You got me on the floor, you know I came to play. I know I shouldn't, but you seem to take my pain away. And every time I score, Jason Tatum fade away. I close my eyes and I'm floating your river. I call to see if you open, you know I hope you deliver. Every time you 